Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce John Lewis uh, from uh, Microvision. Uh, he received his uh, BS degree in physics and mathematics minor from MIT in 1971. He, has, uh, uh, he was an early uh, developer of scanned lasers and applications while at Polaroid from 1979 to 1996. Uh, work there resulted a, in a laser printed media system for medical diagnostics. He joined Microvision in 1996 where he's been since. And he's uh, built a research group there to develop the scan beam technology. He's the author, uh, author and co-author of 22 Microvision patents and patent applications and wrote a general description of this work in the May 2004 IEEE Spectrum magazine cover entitled In the Eye of the Beholder. In 2003, he was appointed Microvision Fellow and he's currently seeking to enable the adoption of this technology into a wide range of applications. So uh, please uh, welcome uh, John Lewis. Thank you. Thank you. Right. And uh, my thanks to uh, Steve for arranging all this and uh, giving me the opportunity to tell you about scan beam technology. And um, I hope to have uh, further conversations with some of you uh, later as in, the, in the course of the day. Um, so while I'm telling you about this, uh, you know, I think it's be just stop with questions. Um, I've got a lot of slides, but a lot of them are picture slides. So um, uh, I'll be saying words, and there'll be pictures up there. Uh, and the way I've got this set up also is I'm going to be talking about scan beams. Um, and uh, let me get this going here. Um, and that's kind of an outline. So when you see that color slide, we're back to the outline. I've got these stuck in between the various sections. Um, so I'll start off by giving the, the general concept of what ScanBeam is and the general range of applications that uh, it can be apl applied to. Uh, then I'm going to take advantage of describing a head-mounted display which was the first microvision um, embodiment of this technology, and use that to introduce the, the light sources, the scanners, and the other things relative to this technology. Uh, then I'll just tie that up with uh, uh, look at some of the issues that you really need to attend to if you are going to make a head-mounted display, and just the light sources and the scanners are not enough. Um, then I'll move into uh, the other side of uh, scan beam, and that is its ability to not only output information, but to capture information. And in fact, you know, anyone knows that ray traces, you can reverse all the arrows on them, and they're still true. So this technology takes advantage of that in a fundamental way. And uh, so there is some additional technology developed for image capture, and then I'll introduce that. Um, that was then put together and applied as an, in an endoscope. Uh, where the objective was a very small size, and I've got some detail about that. Uh, and then, having described the technology for display and capture, then I'll move into, gee, what possibilities might there be if you use the same device to do both things in a product application? So, uh, so, uh, so here's the basics of ScanBeam, uh, the basic concept, and I'm sure I'm uh, this is only a safety slide. I'm sure you pretty much all kind of know about this stuff anyway. But like a CRT, uh, but the electron beam is replaced by a photon beam. And this is like clockwise. Pretty soon this is a word that we won't be using. Uh, but there's no vacuum bottle, and uh, photons can be folded off of mirrors where no one's found a way to fold electrons. Um, or maybe another way is to say this is more to it. It's like a laser pointer, right? So, so far, and I can move this around rapidly, and if I was, and of course, yeah, there we go, really adept, I could be blinking this on and off and, you know, draw the Mona Lisa on the wall, you know, with just this. But now I'd have to move my hand really rapidly. But since it's a light beam, uh, then you can um, just bounce that same beam off of a small mirror, and small things can move fast. So that way you get the... Uh, scan beam up to video rates. And in fact, uh, here's a uh, ray tracing. Uh, I use light tools a lot for what I do, so you'll see a bunch of these things. But what we have right here is uh, a fixed stationary light beam coming to a scan mirror. 
and the scan mirror just moves to different angles. And uh, as it does, the light rays off of the scan mirror intersect this curved surface, uh, which things are all pre-designed so that after it hits the curved surface, it comes back as a collimated bundle of rays as if it was coming from a distant object and then into the pupil of your eye. So you have multiple requirements to satisfy. The light has to hit the pupil of the eye and it has to be collimated. And you have one surface over here, so that's the optical design compromise. You have too many constraints on one surface. Uh, but in some places, scan beam can actually give you additional degrees of freedom. So that's the scan beam concept. And that's uh, spectacle lens and that little optic that would be there. And that would give you about an SVGA type of um, display. So uh, the technology has a common core. Uh, this is an ancient type of MEM scanner, but that's a MEM scanner. It's about five millimeters total size. And you can put that together with you know, electronics and ASICs uh, with light sources. At lower power, smaller, dimmer displays, you can make do with just LEDs, single LEDs. Uh, for larger displays and higher, brighter displays, you would want to be using lasers. Uh, the common thing is, is that the light from the laser gets collimated and gets combined by either wavelength or polarization and forms that beam like this beam. Okay. Uh, so if you put that together with uh, one kind of optics, you can do things like uh, eye shades or a camera electronic viewfinder or a small display for a cell phone. Doesn't use a lot of light. Uh, so those sort of applications are accessible. With a little bit more light, you can do something where you have a beam combiner over here, which allows you to see a big, you know, primarily most of the real world. But the light coming down is bright enough so that you get this uh, augmented vision uh, uh, application. And then also you could uh, just do rear projection displays with the laser light, just put it onto a screen. If it gets up to a watt or so, you've got it. If it's um, a tenth of a watt or something like that, which is accessible from diode lasers, then you can do an automotive head-up display because what you do is you preferentially deliver the light to where you know the person's head is going to be. And in fact, microvision is uh, uh, doing that now, and uh, people are very excited about it. Uh, with about one and a half watts, maybe three watts of power, uh, you can do an on-the-wall or a table type of uh, rear projection display. And I'll have some more detail in, of that in the last section of the talk. Uh, personal display. Great thing about the industry that we're in is that there's this huge pressure of information, and people want to move it from their desktop to their pocket. Uh, so. Uh, personal display, uh, the problem is, of course, that if the convenience is high, the display is small. If there's a lot of information content on the display, you're lugging around a big thing that only lasts a couple of hours. And then there are compromises, but none of these are solutions. So maybe ScanBeam can give a solution to that. Okay, so now we're back to the outline again. Uh, the section we're going to go into next is the technology uh, developed from the uh, head-mounted display origins. And here I'll show you the scanners, the light sources, things about human vision, uh, which I put next to the data channel because they're similar functions. And then also uh, the, what the uh, image quality results you might expect uh, could be. So uh, this is the IEEE Spectrum article, uh, but it's also a pretty neat picture of the display and application. Uh, you can actually see a, a little off of the cornea. Uh, the cornea is a very nice optical surface. So you can actually you know, look onto somebody's cornea and see what they're looking at, right? And this happens to be a very bright display, so you can actually see the little red rectangle that's being displayed to the person at that moment. And if there was a camera up here looking at your eye, it would potentially see the same thing. So. Um, so this is the microvision embodiment of scan beam that was actually designed in 2003. Uh, there are new things that haven't reached product yet. Um, but anyway, so in this one, the idea was to give a streamlined experience, uh, favor your real world view, because all that's in front of your eyes is just a single flat piece of plastic uh, that lets most of the ambient through. 
And also, you know, you got to pay attention to cosmetics if it's going to be anything that anybody's going to, you know, uh, you know, use in their office. Maybe that's one level of, you know, okay, people don't necessarily come into your office all the time. Or if you're going to, however, another, the ante goes up, if you're going to walk out of your office into the cafeteria, you know, it's got to meet a much higher standard, right? Um, and then there's the other extreme where you're a military pilot and you're going to wear it because they told you to. And actually, that's where a lot of this technology came from. Um, but this one, one of the other nice features about it is that, yeah, okay, there's a wire that goes down to something on your belt. Um, uh, so head wire to your pocket, let's say. But then from there, it's a wireless link to the base, and the base is playing uh, web pages. And a technician is using this to do a repair job based on manual pages that are, he's untethered and getting wirelessly. Um, to introduce a little bit of the uh, electronics that go behind this, uh, you have a stack over here, which is like a wireless interface, user interface, processors, and memory. Just a generic, uh, you know, handheld appliance functions, uh, what a PDA would do. Uh, there's an interface here to view memory. So this guy wants to play a picture, so it dumps it into view memory. Another word for that is frame buffer, but we call it view memory because we think of it one-dimensionally instead of two-dimensionally. Okay? Uh, because what happens is the bits in there are just clocked out through uh, a set of DACs to the red, green, and blue light sources. That happens all the time uh, to, keep the, to keep the screen refreshed. Um, what you put in there is up to the processors. The, uh, the scanner itself, uh, there's a microcontroller, and there's a, a digital to analog, analog to digital loop. So it's an analog device out here, but the control of it is digital. Uh, and uh, the MEMS device itself is very predictable. It's made out of silicon. It's undergoing elastic deformation. There's no sliding or any other things going on. And I, you'll see that when I show you the scanner. Uh, and then some synchronization between the two. And then using, you know, the wonder of a beam splitter, uh, sometimes you use wavelength, sometimes you use polarization, a number of different optical effects to do the combination. Uh, you get this red information superimposed on your real world, real world, real world view. Yes? Uh, this is just a display right now. So in other words, if your hand was out there, how does it know where your hand is? Oh. So is it, it's not a resonant mirror, you're just, you're I'll show, I've got that in a slide later. It, it, it basically uses sensors on the, on the flexure. Well, current level of technology for cost says that we're going we're gonna to try and find market niches that would where red monochrome would be okay. okay. Yeah. But the red, but the... Diagram Yeah, and we have done it with color, like an electronic viewfinder at lower luminance. Yes? Is it just cost-efficient, or would the two extra colors No, uh, folding in full color, and in fact, I've got a slide later on that shows a full color. Uh, you'll, you'll see exactly that uh, the components that do that are in the size of uh, 5 or 10 millimeters. So it doesn't add anything significant to the size on your head. Yeah. The illustration you show there is something that you can The we know a lot. Uh, the, actually, the, uh, the vertical axis is driven with a sawtooth, so that's uh, actually random axis. It could be. Um, the uh, horizontal to do the fast scan is resonant to get it up to like 20 kilohertz. But if you wanted to do um, um, uh, random axis in both axes, it would be possible. Uh, it, is a resonant system. I mean, it, it, it's a, you're controlling a system. It's a, a spring and mass that has a resonance at about 600 hertz. So you have to know your control theory, what you have to input to that system in order to get your desired trajectory. And we've been able to do a very nice 60 hertz sawtooth with a very sharp retrace. Uh, 
in like one millisecond, despite that uh, ringing behavior that you would see if you went at it in an unsophisticated manner. So if there was an application that needed uh, random access, I think it would be computed. Yeah. Given, given, given the yes, I think uh, it would be right. Instead of spreading out over a whole area, you you actually get about a factor of a hundred when you consider the area of a line compared to the the whole area. Um, it's possible. It's not the mainline approach, but you know, if there was some application that had to track something using MEMS, not out of the question. You have to use co computation. Yes. Uh, it's probably uh, on the retina. It's probably about ten microns. Uh, it's uh, it's about uh, it's about a two minute two minute pixel at thirty cycles per degree. It's uh, yeah, it's about a two minute pixel. Um, so you can. Uh, I hope that answered your question. Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, let's see. So we're there. Okay. Um, oops, I'm going the wrong way. So now, the scanner, we'll get into some of those questions were this, about the scanner. Um, Microvision leads the world, I believe, in, in the application of the scanning technology. And uh, there are a lot of things you can do wrong. It's easy to make uh, you know, uh, an academic paper and do it once. But to control the scanner um, and synchronize it to the data uh, and do all the other things you need to do correctly is um, took Microvision, you know, almost 10 years to get where it is now. Fraunhofer, we've been working, Microvision's been working with, with Fraunhofer. They actually have a very good um, MEMS group. Uh, they have some uh, good manufacturing capabilities. Their work was supported from some semiconductor mask work that, you know, dollars are no consequence, and they were using uh, MEMS to do spatial light modulating. Uh, Symbol, um, people, uh, Andy was telling me about Symbol and some of their advances. I don't know that much about what they do, but I know that they're commercial. Um, and then there's other research groups like Ber Berkeley Sensors and Actuators that have some very good papers on, on scanners. And dot, 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 uh, you have always have to keep your eyes open for you know, advances. Um, I think the only thing I'll say on this one is that it's a biaxial scanner. So this is a very early scanner. It's a square mirror. Um, but uh, you have one. Uh, you have the ma mirror, which is a mass, and then you have a torsion bar type of flexure. So that's a spring, and uh, so you get spring and mass resonant oscillation. But also, it's, it's also an axis of rotation. So you use another axis of rotation along this direction, but now using magnetic coils, um, you can get a you know a motor effect, uh, B cross V type of forces, and, and get uh, constant deflections. Um, the, on this version, uh, it was uh, excited electrostatically, which meant that we needed high voltage and it was not very strong force. We've since moved on from that. But again, here's a sort of sinusoidal motion that you're going to get. And uh, when you get down to the bottom, if this is a sawtooth, you're quickly up to the top and you do it all over again. But you'll notice that you know, the lines are on slants and you're going to get um, pinching of the uh, scan pattern at the ends, And basically, however, you're going to get that every frame forever and ever and ever. So it's really a, uh, an image quality design issue, uh, sampling uh, reconstruction functions to, given that canvas, to use that to express your image. So we know that stuff well. Again, here's the evolution. Uh, it used to be in a vacuum. It's now a biomagnetic design. Uh, that operates in air. And here's one of the later version scanners. So size relative to a pencil, that's the size of the scanner. So you can imagine how many of those you're going to get on wafer. And uh, these coils over here, uh, coupled to magnetic fields to actuate it, there's only one coil and the fields are at an angle so that the uh, currents in that one coil uh, allow us to drive the outer gimbal in a sawtooth but also excite the resonance of the inner gimbal so that we just have two wires um, giving us both axes of motion. Uh, to uh, help with timing the data, uh, there is, we can put strain gauges um, 
on the Fletchers and tell what's happening from that. Uh, but the thing is, is that particular scanner design requires a magnetic field uh, structure around it. So it gets to a size of about one cubic centimeter which fits quite nicely in that nomad that I showed you. Yes? Oh, what are the other pads for? Uh, the other pads go to the strain gauges. Um, so there are uh, two excitations and two, uh, it's a bridge. So that's a lot of wires. Um, actually, um, you'll see when, when I talk about the endoscope, you don't need even those. So if you're talking about simplification, um, you know, stay tuned, right? So it's small enough for many applications. Uh, there's a paper on it, Photonics West, uh, Randy Sprague, Tom Montague, people from uh, Microvision. So you can read more about it there. Um, those are the people that actually did this work. Um, here's a comb drive. This, I believe, is a Fraunhofer device. Um, the, uh, this is one and a half millimeters, so this whole chip is five millimeters square, but the main point about the comb drive is that's it. You're done. Um, the, there's a very fine structure around the edges of the mirrors. Like here's the flexure for the mirror right here. And here's the mirror area. And so the cones are over here, and it's like pushing someone on a swing. When they're down at the bottom, you give them a push, and then they go off, and they come back, and you give them a push again. So it's the only place where comb can input, at least this type of comb. It's like the reverse Yeah. Yeah. And, but the other neat thing about it is, is that um, uh, you can get very large angles because the, uh, all the force comes in like at top dead center, if you will, um, or you know, when you're crossing zero. Um, and so this thing could actually go around four times and then come back the other way. I mean, just like, you know, think of those anniversary clocks, right? They've got a heavy weight on a thin torsion thread. They don't care about 360 degrees. They just wind up until they finally stop, and then they go back the other way. So, um, so this removes the angle limitation. Um, and uh, so you can, so anyway, that's one of the nice things about that. And again, there's publications. Uh, actually, the group, the MEMS, the um, some of the groups that uh, do this are chaired by uh, former uh, Microvision employees, so kind of interesting. Key to the MEMS device is uh, designing it, and that's a lot of finite element analysis, and what you really need to do is know what the stress is, well actually the most fundamental thing is what's the deformation of the mirror going to be? Because the whole reason you're moving it is to have a mirror, and uh, if the mirror is not flat or it's not a good mirror, then don't bother with anything else. So once you figure out your speeds, thicknesses, support structures to get the mirror to go fast enough over a large enough angle, then the next thing you worry about is, well, can the flexures, which are taking the kinetic energy from the mirror motion and then storing it up to be played back again, uh, will those guys live? And that's an energy density thing. And uh, so if the flexure design that you have uh, is not strong enough for the frequencies and masses you're operating, you can make the flexure longer, reduce the energy density in it, and still have a solution. So that's why the mirror is the most fundamental, the flexure is the next thing down. Then after you have the mirror and the, f and the basic suspension mechanism, then you have to figure out how to actuate it. And uh, there, uh, you can always recover from a poor actuator design by using large amounts of power. Okay? So that from a fundamental way is a way of sort of like organizing all the little problems you have to solve. But on the other hand, when you're talking about product, all those problems are, need to be solved simultaneously to the requirements of the application. Um, so, um, and here's some of the design details that go into, uh, I've already told you about the uh, encoders. These are strain, this is a strain gauge. Keep the mirror flat. Uh, yeah, you want it light and stiff, um, so don't think of something as a slab of granite. Think of a smart structure. What would that be like? Because mass uh, is going to cost you uh, to move it. And then you can put coils on things to get, create forces for actuation. And then you have also manufacturing tolerances. Re these are resonant devices, and in fact, we've worked with them with cues as high as 20,000. And in fact, in the literature, there are resonant devices that routinely have cues of 100,000. 
Um, so that's nice. Uh, that's where the spring and the mass are totally canceling. All you're left with is friction. But suppose it happens at the wrong place. So you put tuning tabs on things, or you trim them. Some, you know, some way in manufacture. So that's what these are. These were break off tuning tabs to get the uh, frequency uh, within tolerance. Um, how are those, how are those uh, it was like a, uh, there was a probe that would excite and discover the resonance of that particular mirror. And um, I think they were zapped with a laser. So we actually have moved away from this and, and our system design can accept the uh, range of, of uh, mirrors that uh, the process gives us. Um, Uh, well, let's see. Uh, we actually uh, use, do a lot of the work at WTC where we pilot the designs, um, solve problems. Um, but the actual mirror fabrication is being done out at other labs. Um, a deep RIE is one of the key uh, game changers, if you will. It's made a lot of things possible. A lot of the early things that we did were wet etched. That's why the mirror was square. Uh, but with deep RIE, you can make round mirrors and you know all sorts of things. And also, there's a lot of um, uh, art in knowing how to to shape the side of the flexure, but not put flaws in it, so that you know you get up to a gigapascal. So. Uh, we right now are using them just in air, not even backfilled. Uh, when you start talking about, you know, environmental attack of the aluminum coating on it, you know, it very likely would uh, get into more of a sealed package. But actually, the Nomad product that Microvision makes today um, is just an open air scanner in a plastic housing. And, uh, you know, lots of them have gone out to customers and they've complained about things, but they haven't complained about foggy mirrors. So. Uh, so there is, and like any technology, right, it's new, and there are a lot of things that could happen. If someone does it first, you find out what you need to worry about and what you don't need to worry about. And then you go on from there. So that's, you know, that's where this technology is kind of going. Uh, and again, here's the key thing about uh, MEMS is that, you know, that's probably 50 scanners over here. And these, are, these were done when we had scanners that had a dimension of 9 millimeters to them. Uh, for the endoscope, uh, the scanner is a 2 millimeter scanner. So, or we're working on getting one down to two millimeters. So the question is like, how much does a scanner cost? The answer is like zero. Mm -hmm. Or in the Nomad product, this scanner I think costs us about 10 bucks, uh, you know, everything. And uh, in the endoscope, um, I'd be surprised if it was a buck. You know? But again, you have to work out, you know, the particular case. So that's really one of the, one of the key things about this is that the addressing of the array of information you're trying to present is being done with a light beam. And that addressing is done operating at 20 kilohertz, which is just like audio frequencies, not you know, gigahertz or megahertz, but just audio. That's, but that's the addressing function. Uh, what you put there is up to you. And in fact, here's the light source. This is another key part of the technology because uh, the uh, nice thing about scan beam technology is that um, uh, let's say compared to like liquid crystal. Liquid crystal has to make like a million pixels, all pretty good, uh, but they, then they run in parallel. But you're making a million pixels. Um, scan beam, it makes one pixel, one dot on the wall, and that's not going to change as I move it around. But so it can be a very good single pixel, but you have to move it to a million places time shared. So that means that compared to what the light output average from a liquid crystal cell would be. Uh, this has got, got to be a million times brighter. So that's why uh, Nomad is red only, because red laser diodes are cheap, and they're really bright. Uh, we don't have green laser diodes. So not yet, anyway. And in fact, actually, this is your classic busy slide that I had to put in. And uh, you know, I'll try and get us through it real quick and go on to the next one. But this is dollars for unit cost. And this is also rather old, so it's a little bit out of date. Uh, from $1 up to $10,000 for your light source. And this is the power out of your light source from uh, a microwatt here up to a tenth of a watt here. Okay? And I attempted to put some dots on the, on the chart, like uh, what does a diode pump solid state laser cost? Well, you know, you can give B 
BW Tech five thousand dollars and get you know fifty milliwatts of green. This was a few years ago. So you're up here at the, the you know the high price, high power. The human eye only needs about a tenth of a microwatt. If you add up the power, when I'm looking at this screen over here, if you add up the power that's coming from that screen to my pupil and getting into my eye, it's a tenth of a microwatt. Okay, this is just a very inefficient way because it's broadcasting light to people who aren't here, right? Millions of times more light than it needs. Um, so that's human vision. And in fact, edge emitting LEDs can be, uh, you can just take any old LED and get that out of its edge. Um, so this is an attempt to sort of map out the, you know, the win-win places up here where it's low cost and high power, or high enough power for the application. And red laser diodes are moving there. Violet laser diodes, I don't know if anybody's up on Blu-ray. In fact, I've got a chart later on that shows this better. But anyway, that's sort of the map of the universe for light source options. Here's a word version of, this, of the same sort of thing, which is actually a little bit more precise. Um, and I'll fast forward to these two items down at the bottom. Violet laser diode to phosphor or photoluminescent material. That's, that's happening now. Um, also, there's another thing, second harmonic green, that can be directly modulated. That's been a recent development. Um, people are familiar with green laser pointers. You can get them for like, you know, a couple hundred bucks. Um, well, you know, if you go into mass market for an app, mass production for a particular application, you might convince yourself you can get the power, the cost down. But the problem is, is that uh, you also have to be able to modulate turn the light source on and off at about 50 megahertz, 100 megahertz rates. And um, diode pump solid state lasers uh, that uh, provide lots of green, uh, they have an ion in it that has a lifetime, so you can't turn those on and off quickly. Um, second harmonic green, what it does is it uses semiconductor lasers, which you can turn on and off quickly, and piplin, uh, nonlinear material that uh, through you know, distortion of the sign creates a second harmonic, which actually then captures all of the energy and gives you green. So, um, so this is also to be watched. Um, so it's good to have options now. And um, so I showed you that Nomad, and uh, the, here's a dime, and instead of just a single, here's a laser diode and a lens, instead of having a single laser diode and a lens, we now build assemblies that have three laser diodes at different wavelengths, and a slab a beam combiner, which we've evolved. It's a very uh, inexpensive, mass-produced way of uh, getting three different wavelengths together. Or you can use polarization, too. And what's that? Uh, one, of the, one of the coatings is, uh, one of them is dichroic, yeah. Uh, actually, one of them is a polarization uh, coating, too. Um, and another one is a high reflective. We, we actually, yeah, so we put a red laser here. You can see it in operate. It's being lined up over here. There's a red laser diode here, and this is just a 100% mirror. Mm -hmm. um, this is a blue laser diode, and this is a violet laser diode. And we chose to use polarization on this surface so that this could now be a violet laser diode at one polarization, and this could be a violet laser diode at another polarization. And the level of integration we chose to go with right now is um, we'll still take the lasers in a can, put lenses on them, and put them in a slab. And that's, compared to a dime, fits on your head pretty well. Uh, there's, of course, another level of integration that you're seeing in uh, optical storage heads where they have to be backward compatible with older, uh, like blue's got to be compatible with red's got to be compatible with IR. So you, uh, the optical storage head manufacturers are now putting multiple chips under one optic. So, um, and, you know, so that, that will come on here, too. And in fact, actually, this is a, uh, an important slide to look at, to, uh, you know, be ahead of the game instead of behind it. You know, like, look at a trend, not catch on to it after everyone else. So, um, this is year, 1980. It's, it's actually a pretty long-range chart. It goes, you know, five-year increments, right? And this is logarithmic units of units manufactured. So here's uh, 10,000, 100, a million. This is the million level. 10 million, 100 million, uh, a billion. And you know, up here is like one for everybody on the planet. 
right? And in fact, actually, the IR laser diodes are probably there when you add up all the years. The first uh, compact disc products came out in the mid 80s for audio, C audio uh, CDs, audio, audio discs, and that became computer CDs. So those are now manufactured at like 350 million a year for the optical storage industry. Um, it, but it took a number of years to get there. And then you look at red DVD, first product, and these were like product announcements from, you know, Sony or somebody, was the first product announcement from them was 1996. A few years later, uh, they're up at like 20 million a year, okay? And they just passed um, IR uh, last year, uh, and they're too up at around 350 million a year. Well, Violet laser diode technology, violet laser diodes were invented by Nakamura at Nichia in the mid, in the early 90s. And that's what's given all these blue LEDs and things that people are using for uh, projectors and illumination. Um, but the question is, well, when was that ever going to start? So, uh, so you take this trajectory, which is modeled after the red trajectory, and the first time people published about it, they put it, you know, like about here, about four years after the red generation. Well, I guess that didn't happen because that year's come and gone. But anyway, uh, Strategies Unlimited in 2003 projected this trajectory. I just recalibrated it with this data point, which is the PlayStation 3 is coming out with um, Blu-ray technology, you know, for their uh, storage. And over a course of their first year, they're going to put out like four and a half million units. And we're in Xbox territory, so you guys know the numbers really well, right? So that violet laser diode component is going into the Xbox, let's say, uh, as supported by Sony. So yeah, it's going to be manufactured uh, in the millions uh, in the next year. Yeah. Right. Then, then nothing else follows. So you sort of feel like I mean, it's like I don't know, like uh, uh, essay, you know, the high-end audio CD or, or one of the people might just not find that you know the high-tech DVDs are really worth it and not the glory all the collection. In which case, the curve doesn't have to. It's true. It's true. Uh, you know, I, I would I would not bet my life on this, yeah. but I actually would bet a substantial amount of money. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right, and maybe I am in a, in a certain way, right? <laughs> Uh, the, uh, but I mean, it's, it's, it's orchestrated. This is going back at least 10 years. I mean, I go to the, the information display conferences. That's why you have a 16 by 9 aspect ratio on HD, because that makes all the old equipment obsolete, right? And uh, that's why, you know, uh, it also says it takes more information. So that means the red DVDs can't quite cut it. So you went out and bought a new set, so now you want to play to it. But you know the the uh, the joker in all of this is magnetic storage, because in in fast network, so you know TiVo and the like, uh, you know, uh, that that actually is motivating these guys to actually move it quicker, because they they're seeing that they're not the only game in town. Okay, but the basic fact is is that today there are factories in place and multiple multiple suppliers, uh, you know, Nichia, Sony, Toshiba, Sanyo, they all make these things. Right. And what they're producing looks just like what they've already produced. It's just that the material chip is different. Um, so uh, then what you do is you put violet excitation together with photoluminescent materials, which are tried and true. PDPs use um, vacuum UV wavelengths to make red, green, and blue. That's actually rather inefficient because that's a short, very short wavelength, whereas if you use 405, um, you're, you're giving up less energy to get up to the, to the blue and the green. And also, the other thing that drives that, that's really great about the way this is going is that the uh, general illumination industry um, is, you know, trying to, well, we all know there's a lot of activity in le LED illumination, right? And a lot of it where they put a phosphor blend over, over the LED. So the, uh, the research that Osram or General Electric used to do to make more efficient fluorescent lights, and then they finished that 20 years ago and parked it. Well, they're now very active, and I was just in a conference where uh, talking to the people who are actually doing this work. So materials for violet excitation by scan beam are actually improving a lot. 
And I also have to mention, too, um, uh, companies like Evident uh, that are doing um, nanocrystals. Uh, so that's another PL type of material that has very good properties. Um, I'm going to have to move on real, um, a little bit more quickly here, because, uh, uh, and I'll try. So in fact, I think through this section, I'll flip really quick. This is the visual system. Uh, you want to basically understand uh, when you're making a head-mounted display, you need more intimate knowledge about the human visual system than you do if you're just making a display on the wall. Although if you're making a display on the wall, you should not be ignorant of the fact that the head moves and other things happen too. Um, so the main thing about this is that, yeah, we model it and uh, try and do systems design with this. And that the cornea is a very good optical surface. And I have another eyeball over here. You can see a reflection of it and a target that this eyeball is looking at, which is out here. And you can, you can see reflections of things. Uh, then you take that from you know, something like POV ray or just a general you know, artsy model and now put that into an optical design program and you start to understand a little bit more about how the eye works. Here's the fovea. Here's the optic nerve. You have a blind spot here. You see nothing there, right? We all know that. Um, but also, um, while you're looking at this light, this magenta light, you'll notice that the other objects that are still there are actually not coming into such great focus on your retina. Now, this is not the best eye model in the world, but it's, you know, in, there are, there's more work to be but there are very good eye models out there. Yes? You mentioned the cornea is a very nice optical surface. Yes. Does this provide a lot of Well, actually, that's one of the places where people have studied a lot of work because there's a lot of money in uh, laser surgery. So, um, so they know, uh, I've seen papers about you know, the, um, uh, the optical aberrations by the tear layer, the tear layer that's over your cornea. So. Um, and people have fit the, uh, you know, when they give you eye surgery, they essentially uh, know to the submicron what the shape of your cornea is. There's instrumentation to encode that, polynomials and fitting procedures all in place. So it's very well known. Um, not that I've taken advantage of it in any designs at this point, but, um, you know, uh, you need to be aware of it. And then also things about, uh, this is the main one, you know, their, your spatial frequency. Guess what? You know, we, we're a fixed target. I mean, we know how much resolution we have. And you know what? It's not infinite. So, uh, so when you design an optical system, you need to know that about 30 cycles per degree is where your contrast sensitivity peaks. You also have to know that at low frequencies, um, you know, if this was an old-fashioned type of projector, I'd say that you know, this center would be you know, twice as bright as the edge. Probably it's better on this projector. But even if it was, people wouldn't particularly know that. That's like a low frequency roll off. Um, the other thing is, yeah, we're in a process in information. And uh, short answer there is like you have 10 to the 8 sensors in your eye. You can count the, the cones and the rods people have. Uh, 10 to the 6 axions in the optical nerve. So there's some local uh, compression in the information. Um, and then 10 to the 10 neurons in the visual cortex. And, who knows what they do, but there's a lot of them. And they're very highly interconnected, right? So, um, uh, so if you're just thinking about displays, you can start thinking about the sensors, but you have to realize that there are these higher processes that go on. So when you design a data channel, um, you know, we're trying to create an illusion. And fortunately, um, you know, computing you know, hardware is getting there. I mean, uh, you know, in 1998, the graphics processor unit passes CPU in terms of, uh, you know, operations per second. And uh, that's because it's very specialized for what it does, and it's doing a lot of things in parallel. Um, and in fact, actually, um, so what we're doing here, in fact, this is done by Jim Bovey, who's now a Microsoft employee somewhere. Um, we had him uh, use a uh, frame, uh, uh, for, uh, you know, a graphics card frame and pre-distort the information. Because remember, it's a sinusoidal bidirectional scan. So you have to warp the information so that it, when you play it, it comes out right. So we did that on a graphics card. Uh, 
Uh, this process, um, uh, way back a long time ago, I had that slide that showed, you know, when we draw a picture, it's going back and forth in a sinusoidal motion. It's actually going faster in the center than it is at the edges. Of course, no, no, of course, yes, I'm so, yeah, right. Yeah. So if you clock the data. The scan, the scan, the scan pattern. Right, yeah, okay, got right. It, yeah. And that's also why I call it view memories, because it's, it's actually a, a self-crossing pattern. And, you know, essentially what you have to do is Knowing where you are, uh, just do linear combinations of, the, of what you want to represent to figure out what you're going to put out at that moment. And graphic cards are good, good for multiply and accumulate. Uh, the uh, scan beam technology, um, instead of having all the complexity, all the bits externally, like you have on a, on a liquid crystal display, there's a transistor at every intersection, and it's physically, intimately compromised and intimate with the pixel that you're looking at or PDP, you know, similar things. Uh, with scan beam, actually, I like to think of all the, uh, the images there at some place in, in, in RAM somewhere. Uh, and it is just spooled out through a very simple process, a one-dimensional process uh, in involving the DAC and then the laser and then the, and, the, and the scanner. But there's no complexity out there. So, uh, oops, I think. Where do we go here? Oh, yeah. So anyway, a whole image uh, in 2003 occupied two square millimeters of silicon. And it's going to be a lot less next year, right? You know, way down it goes. So again, the scanner costs zero. The storage for the image costs zero. OK, you've got to pay for the light source at this point. Uh, image quality, I think I'll go through this pretty rapidly. Um, the uh, color gamut. So depending on what kind of light sources you use, if you use lasers, uh, you actually get out to the fully saturated colors, just pure wavelengths. LEDs, uh, they have pretty narrow bandwidth compared to other technologies, so that gets you out to this color gamut, which I think we had. And this black line over here is uh, the standard uh, color gamut for like uh, you know, a stock uh, uh, CRT or liquid crystal. So you have um, extra color gamut with this technology. Um, it's scan beam, so you know, pixelation effects uh, can be reduced because you can, can, you can update along the scan at a much higher rate. You do have the fact that it's discrete lines, and you have to blend properly between them. But you're blending with like Gaussian overlapping blobs. So a lot of the high frequency stuff that would be there, uh, you can erase uh, early on. Yeah, it's, it's the laser spot, yeah. And I, it's, it's actually approximately a Gaussian, but they're like skirts and stuff on it. But it's not, uh, it's not a discrete location of light with black around it. And the screen door effect, in some cases, it, well, it is a problem, and they work to improve on it. Uh, the other thing is, since it, it's only one pixel you're controlling, you can, uh, I know high dynamic range is a coming thing for displays. You may have heard about it because there's a big software component to it. Um, but uh, this technology, these are, this is logarithmic. Uh, so each one of these is a factor of 10. So this shows uh, actual testing of a piece of equipment that controls light over one, two, three, you know, four orders of magnitude, all in that one uh, light source. Because again, the, the devices, uh, LEDs are basically linear. Uh, lasers have a threshold, but you can characterize that and, and uh, stay ahead of it. Um, I think I'm going to just flip through these because I've shown you a lot of that sort of thing. Uh, this is where actually one thing you're doing is uh, tracking the eye's motion. If you did track the eye's motion, you could see how a display, which is in this little box, which gives you that sort of a field of view, can give you that field of view no matter how you rotate your eye. And the extra thing that's being done out here is that there's an additional tracking mirror. So it's kind of like I've got a display, but I move my eye off over here, and then somebody else magically moves the display over there. Do you guys have that working? Uh, no. But it'd be, I mean, yeah. it'd be a one-month project with machine vision, I mean, and it would be a lot of fun to do. Yeah, Well, the, um, this is, this is in the section where I talk about HMD, is that when you look at what these on-the-head things do, um, they're not, they don't do everything that they need to do. And one of the things they don't do is they give you this little window that you can look into 
but if I turn my head and look at the same thing, the window's over here, but you're still over there. So I can't draw you unless I also had pixels there. So in order to get you at SVGA resolution, I'd have to have enough display horsepower for, you know, 10 of you. Or I could have one of you and then pull this little optical trick of, like, stabilizing your location, right? So, uh, and I think, actually, there's a, it, it would work well, actually. Yeah, <laughs> or I just insert it directly, you know. This is only going to be a blip in history anyway, because pretty soon we're going to bypass the retina. Uh, anyway, uh, I do want to get to um, the image capture stuff, and I see we've got five minutes to the hour, so. Uh. Yeah. Oh, but I'm traveling after this, aren't I? Okay, good, so then I won't yeah. talk real fast, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Uh, yeah, we're about two-thirds of the way through it at this point anyway. Um, so now for uh, uh, image capture, um, the, uh, here's a paper that uh, we gave uh, two years ago when we were doing a study phase of this image capture. And um, the application is for an endoscope. Uh, surgeons, um, you know, this is really, uh, the thing I like about this is it actually helps people a lot. Uh, minimally invasive surgery is very important. Uh, there's so many studies that say that it is. So, uh, but in order to do that, the doctors need to have vision. They, they see what they're doing. Um, so what they use right now, uh, like a rigid endoscope, this will go through your chest cavity and they'll be working inside. So that's where they get to look. And this is actually an optical relay, just a whole bunch of lenses. And then out here, you have like any old camera that you want, the best, you know, Sony three chip camera uh, you know, kind of hooks up over here. And there's an illumination port where, let's say, a xenon light just comes in and that light travels down here and, you know, illuminates the whole scene. So, and the length of this is maybe about, you know, a foot. So that's, that, that's one application. Another application is flexible endoscope. And there, um, image resolution isn't so important. Just getting any image uh, is important. And being small. So this wants to be about uh, five or six millimeters in diameter. And it's the end of, of a long tube that's about a meter long. And um, the way it goes is, uh, uh, well, so that's what the endoscope types are. Now, the way you do that with scan beam is uh, you use fibers to go down the long, uh, narrow channels. Um, so you have light sources, red, green, and blue. You combine them into a single-mode fiber launch. That goes whatever distance you need to go, a couple of meters. Uh, in this test setup, we had an external fixed mirror, but it goes off of a scanner. Uh, then the focused beam goes off of the subject. That, that's where the beam picks up the image information because the light is absorbed or not, depending on whether it's high or low reflectivity. And depending on that reflectivity, then you get more or less signal at a big, fat, multi-mode collection fiber, which, again, just funnels it all the way back down to this rack of instrumentation, separates it out into wavelength channels, and we just happen to do two or three, but you can do more, um, and goes to fast detectors, a digitizer, and then a computer puts it all back together, and you take a look at the picture. So, A very sharply focused flashlight, though. Right, and there isn't a, there isn't a, a scattering that causes this kind of be sort of illuminating thing that you don't want to be illuminating? Uh, no, actually, it's, it's kind of like uh, here's the flashlight, okay? So the flashlight um, is scattering a lot of light into the room uh, now, um, and if I get on that little black spot, less, right? Now you can see I've had not my head caught. Whatever, a little little shaky here, but I had get so there's less power output from that spot, and uh, so any detector placed anywhere, either close to that or can be far away, could be on the endoscope itself, could be on some other thing that they poke into you, anything that just collects the amount of um, uh, collect. Here, it's a better way. I got a better shot. There's a lot of light reflected into the room. Not a lot, a lot, not a lot. So now if I'm doing this dynamically. 
and I have a fast enough detector, it can tell me that I went over a black bar there. Because so Right. But you know what the, the, the brightness of the first thing is. Exactly. Right, yeah, it's like, and, and you're right, there are effects, uh, the multipath effects. Um, but that's like, uh, when you think about it, there's a lot of similarity between this and um, uh, the way a more conventional endoscope would work. You're talking about it's like radiosity effects, where the light that hits, you know, the subject uh, bounces off the subject, bounces off the white wall, and onto the subject again. So these multi-path things we, we can account for. And, um, and actually, you can experiment with them because we have a setup here. So uh, it's pretty easy to implement one as long as you have the software to do the reconstruction on your PC. Uh, a box here with detectors and amplifiers, another box here to control the scanner. And this is, you know, all could be condensed down, but actually for this application does not need to be. Uh, you know, because you're in a surgical suite and there's a rack like this with a display on top of it. So this is actually not too far off what a product would be like. Uh, that's an important issue. Um, the, uh, uh, and there are a number of uh, ways to look at it. There's color fidelity, and then there's uh, color distinction. So if you're trying to be able to, to judge healthy versus not so healthy uh, tissue, um, three narrow laser lines uh, properly placed can actually give you uh, nearby things that you'd plot out in color space get spread out further uh, because these narrow samples don't smear things as much. But on the other hand, if you're trying to do color fidelity, and what that means is you're trying to replicate uh, in what's on the screen what, would, what you would see if you had the patient opened up and you had a, a thermal tungsten halogen lamp or a xenon lamp looking at them. Um, that would require uh, a light source more matched to thermal. So, it's, um, uh, so if fidelity is the most important thing to you, then there are going to be some uh, color artifacts that you will not like about scan beam. But if you gave us more money, we could put oh, additional wavelengths in there. Um, so this is a simple setup. Uh, here's the, that vacuum version of the scanner. Uh, laser beam comes in here over fiber. Uh, I, comes in over light, the laser light comes in over fiber, gets focused into a beam off of the mirror, gets scanned onto the subject, and this is just a little resolution card, right? And then reflected light from that subject point goes everywhere. The only rays that we really care about are the ones that make it into these multi-mode fibers that are on their way back to photomultipliers. Okay? And this is what we used here was like swimming pool lighting, uh, two milli three millimeter fibers. So is, is the, the amount of light that gets reflected off that screen bounces off the mirror and actually goes back through the opposite path of the like, is that negligible? Or can you actually put a photo detector on that, on, on that, on that opposite path? Yeah, there's another path, um, like, I, like I say, the light goes everywhere. So I think Steve's pointing out that there will be also a path back onto your scan mirror, and the scan mirror will actually de-scan the light. Uh, you know, it's an identity phenomenon. It's the same mirror that caused it to go off at that angle. Uh, when you reverse the ray, it comes right back the same way it came. So it actually will make it back to this mirror, and it actually will make it back to that lens, and it actually will be focused down onto that single mode fiber, and it actually will get all the way back. And when you get back to where the light sources were, uh, oops, right here, uh, you could put another splitter over here and go to your detectors. Yeah. That works. Yeah. And people have done that optical uh, tomography, and you know, it, it's, it's done. The thing is that it's, it's, uh, it's um, difficult you have to have very good coatings and you know um, and also it causes um, a, 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 a narrowing of your depth of your of your imaging depth it's actually used for optical sectioning because you get the focusing effect of the laser light twice once on the way out and once on the way in so when you're out of focus you yeah. get nothing and they wanted a little bit more depth of focus so um, so I'll skip these slides um, basically 
you can calculate how much uh, light comes back. Um, this is somewhat interesting. This is, this is a good illustration of the whole scan beam process, the way to think about it. So yeah, you're scanning over the world with patterns like this. You know you're going to be there because the MEMS is such a good device. Maybe it'll be a little larger scale, maybe a little bit smaller scale, maybe this little, but you can learn that over time. So you're collecting samples on some trajectory. And in fact, actually, I put a little white dot every place we would say that's where we're taking a sample. Okay? And actually, if you don't control the scanner correctly, if the fast scan and the slow scan uh, frequencies are out of sync, uh, you get patterns like this. If you control a little bit better, this is like one of the secrets of how you do it right. Uh, you get a pattern like that. Okay? But it's still not a rectangular grid. But even a rectangular grid's got holes in it. So it's just a matter of knowing where, what you're dealing with. So, yeah. That is the laser spot. So in other words, this is like the scale. Uh, this is, uh, they're all on the same scale, right? So the little white dots are the trajectory that you're following and where you're taking your sample. And if you make your laser too sharply focused, you're not going to gather information about these black holes. So it's, it's a classic sampling, filtering, reconstruction problem. And in fact, uh, you can work at it by building hardware and seeing how good the pictures in the hardware come. Or you can build a software model of it, which is one of the things I did, and then start working on making your choices that way. So is there, is there the what? MTF, uh, yeah, you want it to be the, the uh, optical blur of the spot. You will have motional blur uh, because the spot is moving while, uh, while the other things are collecting information. Um, but you can treat that. You can just sample more often. Then also, your detector is going to have a bandwidth associated with it. Uh, and that will essentially um, cause these samples to, you can, you, can, you can work in time space and map it back into this space. And I think on this one, you'll find that the, uh, the blurring caused by the bandwidth limitation of the photomultiplier amplifiers is significant. So again, different designs will have different bottlenecks. You could pay money to get rid of different bottlenecks. Um, so this kind of shows you too that there's really uh, you're actually more familiar with this stuff than you than you might think. You know, I mean, I know all about it because I've been working with it for years, but you know a lot about it because you've been using cameras. So if you make the scan spot relatively large, you know, not too tightly focused. And how you do that, you, you use a very narrow beam so that diffraction spreads it out a lot. Uh, what you end up with is like, oh, that's a cheap camera, a fixed focus camera. It's got a small opening for the lens, right? But uh, it doesn't give you a really sharp picture, but things can be near, things can be far. It's, it still gives you a pretty good picture. So that's what this uh, plot shows. This is distance of the subject, and this is like the number of resolved spots across the field. And if we use a slow beam, uh, we get up over this red line, which is, I believe, around uh, 750 resolved. Might be 800. But let's call it 800. 800 resolved uh, after you're 10 millimeters away and out forever. Okay? Now, if you can use essentially all the same uh, equipment, you just make the scan mirror a little bit larger, but then focus is a lot fussier. Uh, you get resolution up to like 1,700 spots, but only when the subject is between uh, 10 and 13 millimeters. And then it just, you're out of focus. Just like what do artistic photographers do, they use a fast lens and just the flowers and focus and the backgrounds out of focus. But if you wanted to design a product that took sharp pictures and you were willing to refocus as you went, then this is the design you would use, right? But if you wanted a point and shoot, that's the design. So that's the point of this slide. Um, this kind of shows you the algorithm that uh, does the reconstruction. So you have this bisinusoidal motion. It's actually compressed at the top and the bottom. This is now no longer a sawtooth. It's sinusoidal vertically and sinusoidal horizontally, just with different frequencies. And you have lots of fun picking you know, frequencies and ratios of frequencies and, and so on. Um, and there's a wide variety. But basically, after you basically have covered the whole area, you can like fill in the picture. And there are optimal ways of doing it. That. That's one of the things that you can study is the best way to 
take the samples that you got and reconstruct what was probably out there. Uh, resonance is a real easy way to get motion. Right. And that's for the on the head display. On this endoscope, size is so important oh, that we went down to sinusoidal. And also, um, there might, maybe on the head might go sinusoidal. The problem with sinusoidal is that you have eye motion artifacts. So, and so the, here's some pictures that that took that we showed in that paper. We looked at flowers, and it's fun. You can see a lot of detail in there, things you never saw before. And this is uh, you know, early, fa early stage uh, development of technology, so we were really thrilled by this. Put a USAF target out there. Uh, you, know, you can count down to there, and we got the resolution, pretty much what we predicted. Um, you can see some artifacts out here at the edges, because that's where that, the scan lines separate. But again, it's all into engineering now. So we can you know, like, uh, you know, match that up to um, the application, in fact. So having built the first system, then modeling it, which is one of the things that I've done, um, you can include all these different effects you know, in different ways by either data or parameters. Uh, take that point spread function. In some places, you're close to it, so it's big. Some places you're f you're closer to focus, so it's small. Yeah. Uh, you can do things like that. You can distort the scan pattern so that that happens. It it flies through the center really fast. I'm going to move it up here a little bit to see people. Yeah. So, yeah, so anyway, those different PSFs, uh, you know, uh, are different in each one of these little blocks. And again, you know, so this is, this is just a modeling output. But that's the idea. It's now we built one of the things. And now we want to say, well, what if, what if, what if, what if? And does that satisfy you? And we also built a virtual image quality lab so we can put, like, wonky rulings. If I built a scope and wanted to test its resolution, I'd put it in a test setup like this where the scope is here. I put a rocky ruling on this slide and move it back and forward, right? Um, and in fact, uh, let's see if I can do this part. Oops. Uh, I've got to get my glasses out. OK. So, like, for example, uh, so instead of just moving it back, it's a wonky ruling. Uh, it's on the test end. But instead of moving it back, I'm just kind of like waving it around sort of stuff. And you can kind of see in this one, actually, that there's not enough filtering because you can see some more A coming in. And actually, that's, some of that's you can blame on the model. And also. Um, I have a bitmap rocky ruling on here, but there's also a procedural lower frequency modulation that you might be able to see. So, so again, that's the sort of thing you want to be able to do is um, uh, use a model to like what if things. Uh, and here's uh, uh, one of the artifacts that comes from bisinusoidal scanning. Um, that's a sign bar chart moving, you know, it's like somebody's waving it back and forth. But uh, when it's not moving fast, see if I can do this. Oh. There you go. You know, it looks like what it's supposed to be. Uh, when it's going through the center, you know, it's a mess, right? So that's kind of the level of our learning right now. So we know that. So gee whiz, can we come up with the right algorithm to turn that into uh, an advantage? So it's sort of like stroboscopic stop motion instead of integrating over a whole frame. OK. I think we're almost done. Um, skip that part. So this is what it this is what it looks like uh, when you turn that technology into an endoscope. Uh, then we actually built one. So this is the thing that uh, is in the lab now. So I, I kind of like this because we drew the pictures of it a couple of years ago, 
and we finally got the scanners and finally did all the packaging and stuff. So you can see now the scanner, scan mirror is here, just a little white thing, zoom, zoom in a little bit. And uh, there's actually a little dot over here, which is a reflector, which is focuses the light back onto the scanner, and then it comes out here. And this ring out here are the collection fibers. And this kind of shows a better view of the scanner and the comb drives around it. So, and it all works, and it took that sort of picture. Right. And, uh, you know, there's somebody who can read the, your identity from your fingerprints, right? <laughs> so here's a touch screen or something like that. Uh, and the technology that did it was basically that and a pair of fibers going to it. Oh yeah, no, they're, they're in place. And, and there are whole companies behind them and doctors are very conservative and they have to, and they, they actually will, rather than ordinary consumers, test if there's a benefit. So, uh, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the anti fee is high. Okay, this, these are the, this is it, this is the last one. So there's that picture, right? And uh, so how would you do that with scan beam? Well, okay, uh, in fact, people around here have, you know, explored this concept, and it's a good one, um, especially since the scanners are on their way to costing nothing. Um, so you have a scanner, uh, a light source, and it could actually be just a single violet laser diode, um, and the detector, and you would have both a display uh, and by using the backscatter light, um, you know, a, um, a, uh, a way of telling where somebody's hand was. That's basically it. And uh, I thank you. That's right, thank you. Yeah.